Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Henry Moore Institute event. I'm Claire Nadal, Programme Coordinator at the Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's Media Poetry event with Louis Kamnitzer and Tan Lin. This is our latest event in our current Sculpture and Poetry research season, which runs until the end of the month. And it's now, the, sadly, the last of our four intellectual artistic blind dates. For each of these events, we brought together a renowned artist and poet to discuss the overlaps between their fields and practices. Tonight, we welcome artist and writer Lou Kamnitzer and poet and artist Tan Lin for a live conversation on the relationships between form, context, and context that shape the impact of public language. We have de developed the Sculpture and Poetry Research season in collaboration with Nick Thurston, Associate Professor of Fine Art at the University of Leeds. Nick co-founded the Artist Writings and Publications Research Centre at the University of Leeds and is a fellow of the Leeds Poetry Centre. He's the author of two experimental books, Reading the Remove of Literature, published in 2006, and Of the Sub Subcontract, published in 2013. He regularly writes for literary and art press, as well as for independent and academic publications. And his most recent book is the co-edited collection, Post-Digital Cultures of the Far Right. Nick will be chairing tonight's In Conversation, um, and I will be handing over to him shortly to introduce tonight's speakers. Our other partner in the research season is Corridor 8, who are a not-for-profit platform for contemporary visual arts and writing in the north of England. Corridor 8 to develop the new Sculpture Poetry microsite, which acts as an archive and repository for the research season, hosting recordings alongside further resources and interviews. We'll be posting a link to the microsite in the chat um, very shortly. Um, Corridor 8 have also commissioned four new pieces of writing in response to each of these four in conversation events. Written commissions by Callan Baldwin Hall and Nicola Singh um, made in response to the first two in conversation events are now available to read online on the Sculpture and Poetry microsite and further writings will be made available in due course. Um, there's also introductory material for both tonight's speakers, Louis and Han, on the microsite. Thanks Claire. I can't believe this is the um, last event in the series. It feels weird. Um, but anyway, thanks also to, to Lara and Lauren at Corridor 8, our media partners. We're hoping to get that microsite populated with the recordings from previous events during March. So please do check back in April and onwards when hopefully the archives becomes a genuinely public learning and sharing resource for anyone who's interested. OK, so to tonight. Um, there are informative professional biographies for both of our guests on the microsite. I'm not going to repeat their many achievements, publications and exhibitions. Instead, I'll just say why I'm so pleased that Tan Lin and Louis Kamnitzer could join us for this, our fourth and final conversation on media poetries. So Tan is joining us from his home in New York. He's an extraordinary writer of all kinds of things, from cultural criticism to autofiction to poetry. He's had a significant impact on the intersection of debates about literature, politics, and media for many of us who care about the stranger ends of those things. His experiments with what he's called ambient literature and with finding and borrowing images and ideas whenever he wants to explore a knowledge gap are experimental and playful and brave. Luis is an internationally renowned artist and cultural critic who's also joining us from home. Uh, Luis's impact on debates about conceptual art, art education, and the social role of artists that get complicated in different contexts have been significant around the world, including, I should say, on a personal note to me as a young student 20 years ago, when I first came across the catalogue for a, a very important group exhibition called Global Conceptualisms. So anyway, thank you both for joining us. Now, in a sense, we've got... Um, three key terms framing our discussion tonight. Uh, we've got sculpture, poetry, and the slightly more awkward one, media. 
Now, I'm particularly interested in how those three things overlap in your respective practices. But I wonder, as a way of getting started, if we could think about your relationships with each of those three things to begin with. So I hope it's OK, but let's start with sculpture. I wonder if we could start by talking about your formative or early experiences of sculpture as a viewer or a maker. Um, Tan, would you mind going first? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I, I thought, you know, in terms of thinking about sort of ambient poetry, what was really interesting to me was, um, <clears throat> I'd say the reception of the poem. Um, and by reception, I mean, in the space of a book, which I think of as sort of an object, um, may not necessarily be a sculptural object, but it's, um, <clears throat> you know, it's something in which a text transpires in. Um, and then <clears throat> I did a number of PowerPoint pieces too. And I was very interested in sort of the room in which a particular poem is received in. So that sort of environmental space is for me a kind of active sculpt sculptural processing of language in real time with a real audience and that sort of thing. So I think in that sense, um, sculpture is very, very bound to sort of, well, reading practices, but also medial practices as well that are specific to say the book. Tan, am I right in saying your, your dad was a ceramicist? <clears throat> yeah, my dad was a potter. We always called him a potter um, and he made <laughs> So, um, <clears throat> and I remember, you know, he was, both my mother and father came from China. So they, um, they came in 48 and 49 respectively. And my father was, he came from Fujian province and my mother came from Shanghai and then they, they, my father went to the University of Washington to pursue a degree in education, a master's degree, but he ended up um, at some point, and I haven't actually been able to figure this out when, but he transitioned to becoming a ceramist. Um, he got a ceramics degree, and then I think he, he taught at the University of Wisconsin at Madison for one year, and then he got invited to set up a ceramics program at Ohio University in Southeastern Ohio. It's in Athens, Ohio. That's where I grew up. Um, it's the poorest county in Ohio. There were no Chinese people when we arrived. Um, and my parents spent most of their lives in, that, in Athens. Um, so, but I remember growing up, my father would not allow us to buy any um, <clears throat> store-bought pottery, you know, slip-poured pottery. <laughs> Every, so everything we ate on at home was basically made by him. And, so you were, uh, you were surrounded yeah. by a certain sort of sculpture right from the yeah. off. Yeah, and I mean, if you live with this stuff, you, don't, you see it in a different kind of way. So <clears throat> we didn't really think of these as art objects. We just thought of these things as, oh, they're in our living room and we eat off them in the dining room and that sort of thing. So it was in that sense quite sort of naturalized. But after my father died, my mother and I went to endless numbers of thrift stores in southeastern Ohio, and we bought a ton of commercial pottery. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we bought all this stuff by Hall and Hall, all this dining ware, you know, it was huge because it was the clay corridor in that part of Ohio and um, a number of European potteries like um, Rookwood, they all set up um, you know, Weller, they all set up pottery factories in that part of Ohio. So there was a copious amount of pottery. Um, I must have probably 25 dish sets now, you know, it's just <laughs> an enormous collection of ceramics. So <laughs> anyway, Thanks, yeah, so my father was a potter, yeah. <laughs> my mother and my mother was a poet. Luis, can I ask you the same question about your formative experiences of sculpture as a viewer or a maker? Well, uh, when I was 16, I entered art school in the sculpture class and was accepted. We were only four people applying, while in painting there were 400 or so. <laughs> and uh, so it worked. It was a very academic school and I didn't think much about it. And uh, there were occasional discussions about form and content, but very superficial. And we'll probably go into that later. And then eventually I got uh, a grant to study in Germany. And I went not because of any German roots, but just because it was available. There were two 
uh, slots for the university and we were only two applicants so it was a shoe in <laughs> and uh, I wanted to go to the school of design in Ulm because I was studying architecture by then I was 18 19 and uh, but was rejected because I had too much sculpture in my background <laughs> so I ended up in the academy of Munich and there it was a very loosely structured studio, which from my view wasn't giving me much. And one day I entered the printmaking uh, workshop and started doing printmaking. And that was, there was a terrific teacher there. And two months later, I got the printmaking award of the academy. So in some ways, my, my life and that was very passive and things happened to me and did guide me into different directions. But meanwhile, I did perceive very intently how I was being taught. And that's really what put me on discussing education and make me feel that I always was behind in my work in relation to my thoughts about teaching. And kept telling myself, I should listening to, I should be listening to myself and follow my advice, which was not easy. But in that process, uh, that led to my break with all of that in 66, in which I became aligned with what eventually was called conceptual art. And that really wasn't that I was particularly interested in conceptual art. And actually I didn't like the title, I preferred contextual art rather than conceptual. But it was really trying to break down the borderlines of craft and go into this other area. And, and today I would put it clearer to me. I wasn't that clear then. The art history is bogged down by being an offshoot of, an, of artisanship. And art is really a little plus added on to crafts. But it's that plus that contains the truth. That plus is really, what are you contributing to knowledge? Mm -hmm. So I shifted trying, and still today, I mean, I use crafts as a way of packaging, as a way of presenting communication, like you would craft words to do that. But that's not it. It's actually kind of a prison that conditions your knowledge and puts it into constraints in order to communicate, but just never grasp the whole thing. Right. And I'm really interested in that whole thing. Yeah. So today I would say, well, at some point I was a craftsman and then I became a, 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 an art worker and then I became a cultural worker. And today I would say I'm a knowledge worker. <laughs> which may sound pompous, but it's very, uh, really intended to be very modest. Because so that's what we all are. We're trying to figure things out. We're trying to organize a universe that is conditioned wrongly or rightly and figure out what's the right part of that. Is it our survival? Is it absolute knowledge and so on? So those questions, mm -hmm. I think art actually, the plus part of art, helps us to deal with that in a much better and broader way than science does or than any discipline does. Because in that sense, I consider art a meta discipline if it's used right and yeah. not a discipline. I, I, I had a question, it might sound facile, but I don't think it is because of that very journey you talked about of moving through phases and getting to a, becoming a knowledge worker. And, and it goes back to your exchange to Germany I mean, do you think you ever really could have been an architect? Well, look, I always want to be a chemist. <laughs> because I figured I can create yeah. with that. And uh, an architect is more constrained somehow. And at the last moment, which is when I was 16, in, in our middle school, we had instruction of our teachers about professions. Our teachers were both uh, middle school teachers and professionals, and some of great distinction, actually. 
uh, my education was terrific in Uruguay and I, I'm very grateful for it and also was free. And the semester before committing yourself in high school to what track you would go, I was convinced I would go into chemistry or sciences. And a friend of mine, a classmate said, well, let's at least go to the lecture of architecture, which was a mathematician, the math teacher, which was my teacher, I had somebody different. But this guy had the reputation of being crazy and Tan would love it because one symptom of his craziness was that on the first day of class, he would assign not a mass issue, but telling them, okay, I want you to study the manual, the, the textbook of the class, and check the cover, the counter cover, and the spine, and report next class. And of course, all the students took it as a joke. And to their surprise, next class, the guy took them to task and he had really meant it. And that reminds me of Tant's work, of course, only 50 years later or 60 years <laughs> later. But in any case, that guy, it was a very, I, I keep telling the story, but it was a stormy day. I mean, a huge storm and rain. And the, we were all waiting for him. And the guy came 10 minutes late, opened the door, violently came in in his rain raincoat. And while he was taking off the raincoat, he just took his hat and threw it on the desk. And while he was undressing, he said, that, that is architecture. I just redesigned the space of the table in that act. And that's what it's about. And that sentence clicked. So next day I registered in architecture. And I did it. <laughs> until fourth year oh, well. and finished fourth year out of five. And one day I went out of the studio. I mean, the, the program was organized around uh, heads of workshops, mm -hmm. distinguished architects that led us. And all the other courses were like satellite to the project. The project was the main activity. So while taking a rest, I went out to the balcony and saw the very manicured garden inside of the school, and uh, which is a landmark modernist building. And the architect had carefully placed paths with flagstones in that garden around the little amphitheater and the pond. And I noticed that the grass was mm. all worn out, creating other paths that the architect hadn't predicted. <laughs> and that, I mean, it's a stupid experience, but that hit me and it was like, inside, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> you know, why should I be designing something to somebody else if somebody else will do what they want to do and they feel they should be doing? So what I should really be doing is not be an architect and impose my vision on people. Mm -hmm. but enable people to develop their own vision. And that was a profession that didn't exist, neither what did bring income. So I dropped out. I dropped out of architecture. But then I was already teaching in art school and doing political cartoons and newspapers. So it wasn't that architect and architecture was a, a non-event in Uruguay. I mean, you, you, <laughs> at the time, you couldn't live off it. Right. So, uh, and then I got to Guggenheim, came to the States and slowly art just took over yeah. and teaching took over. I, I wonder why with, with these formative experiences, Tan, can we jump to you? And, and you, you mentioned in person that your mum was a poet. So can we talk about your formative experiences of poetry? I'm guessing they come from her or with her. Yeah, I must have, I started writing poetry. I think I was in, um, <clears throat> maybe middle school or high school. Um, and, um, you know, we grew up in a sort of, again, it was a university setting. There's a school named Ohio University there. And um, I remember there was, you know, I never went to, to art school or writing school or anything. I, never, I didn't get a degree in writing. Um, 
<clears throat> so I was, um, but in high school, one of my mother's colleagues, his name was Hollow Summers. He was teaching writing there. Um, <clears throat> and he would say, oh, well, your mother says, you know, you're writing poetry, you know, you can come and talk to me. So I would go see him, you know, once a month, um, maybe more. Um, and it went on for four or five years, I think. Um, uh -huh. <clears throat> and, you know, he was, I don't know how to describe it. He was extremely generous with me. Um, and <clears throat> he was seemed glad to see me. Um, and I was happy to show him my work. So, <clears throat> You know, you know, and that was sort of it. Um, and I went to college and I didn't really write too much in college. Um, I never, I don't think I ever took a writing course ever. Um, and <clears throat> when I was, I went to grad school and when I was in grad school, um, you know, I didn't have any money or anything. So, um, <clears throat> and it takes a long time to get a PhD, so. And it's uh, it's slightly uh, it's a slightly abject subject position. So I was, <clears throat> I thought, oh, maybe it would be nice to write poetry again. So I went to the 63rd Street Y, say so had a poetry thing, and it was every Friday or Saturday night. And someone named John Yao was teaching, and he gave us a series of assignments um, where we had to use particular words in a particular order, and we were also not allowed to make sense. So. I did that for four or five weeks. And then John at the end of that said, you know, I'm teaching down in Florida. And <clears throat> would you um, would you like to come? It's uh, this place called the Atlantic Center for the Arts. And he said, you can have a little house. It'll be nice, it'll be warm. It was like March and it was cold in New York. And so I went um, and I wrote my first book there just based on sort of assignments John had given over a five week period. Um, but you know, the funny thing is I went back and I was, I found all my high school poetry folders and I looked at those poems again after, I don't know, this must have been 15 or 20 years ago. And they were, they were really pretty bad pieces of writing. <laughs> um, and, and then I thought, oh, how generous Hollis Summers had been all those years of high school because he <laughs> never, he only encouraged me. He said, you know, you should keep writing and you should do, you know, and of course I'm a teacher now, so, you know, one is always caught between that place where you need you need to encourage, but you also need to be critical enough so that people can, you know, maybe push themselves a little further and find something, um, you know. You know, and I teach now, it's always, <clears throat> you know, I always tell the students like, okay, once you've found something um, and you've done it pretty well, you know, please don't do it again in the course. Try to find something else again and again. Um, and that's the great luxury of being in the class. You know, you can experiment endlessly um, and, and you, you can get away with that. That's, that's a very good thing, as opposed to say, refining a particular technique and then um, polishing it, so. You know, it's kind of, I ask you the same question about your, your sort of uh, formative experiences of poetry. Now, I'm not accusing you of being a poet, don't worry. No, oh, good. But, uh, <laughs> but in terms of the impact of communities that you were part of and that included writers and people identifying as poets who were making experimental forms of culture, I guess. So, uh, poetry in, in Spanish uh, tended to say concrete poetry and, and that kind of deviations, let's say, but traditional poetry tends to be very stereotypical. <clears throat> and uh, I stayed away of it. I, uh, I couldn't bear it. I, I cannot bear Neruda, I mean, which <laughs> I'm supposed to like. Uh, I like Parra, Nicanor Parra, but that's really not because of the poetic quality in terms of poetry, but because something else is going on. So <clears throat> I'm interested in the poetic essence but poetry as a craft was alien i didn't have access to it and actually i had a negative reaction to it so when i use language i'm not interested in in cadence well i'm interested in cadence but i'm interested in the communication part and what i evoke not in the poetic structure and i feel that Actually, if I'm successful in what I write, it's because I'm escaping the constraints of language, not because I'm immersed in language. 
And when I started introducing language in my work, which was in 66, I did it not because I was interested in literature. I was interested in how can I get a precise image using a description? So it was a visual task. And ultimately at the time, I think I was interested in kind of uh, hyper-realism in description, which meant that I should arrive at a sentence that no matter who reads it, would evoke the, exactly the same image. I mean, really exactly. And uh, I had a friend at the time, a, a scientist, he was the head of perception in Bell Labs, Bella Eulitz, who said, well, that's an intriguing problem. Why don't you use hypnosis? That <laughs> is, write a sentence describing a situation and then hypnotize, have a million people hypnotized and illustrate that sentence find the deviations in the imagery from what you were describing, and then rewrite the sentence until you have it. <laughs> Which of course is utopian. And I did it once with a child, who, a dentist friend who used hypnosis for anesthesia. All right. Uh, recommended this 12 year old because he was a good, uh, subject for hypnotism. And then I figured, well, okay, this is an infinite task and I will not pursue it. And actually just the description should be enough. <laughs> so I stated that. But that actually was my first project in language visual area. Mm. Tan, can I come to you about from that first book that you wrote in that 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 kind of heady five week span you just described to us, what's changed? I know this is a terribly big question, by the way, but what's changed in your relationship to those things we gather under the idea of the poetic as certain qualities of language or certain things to explore as a writer and reader? Well, you know, the I think in that first book, the um, <clears throat> I was really a lot of things that people associate with poetry, I, like having a voice or um, a personal style, I was sort of not so interested in that. I wanted to avoid those sorts of things. Um, and all those things that I'd written were, were sort of constraint driven, problem solving exercises in some sort of sense. So the whole notion of sort of, <clears throat> and this sort of touches on what Luis was saying, uh, my relationship to poetry, <clears throat> was, you know, I was not really interested in sort of lyricism or personal subjectivity or the expression of my feelings or all those sorts of things. Those were sort of, I was just, I didn't really want, I wasn't so interested to me. So in that sense, um, <clears throat> you know, the book was an exploration of, you know, different kinds of problem sets and how you would use language to solve those particular things. And, you know, and that touches, I think, maybe on what Louis was saying about okay, we're well, gonna have a sentence and you're gonna have a sentence that relates to particular objects in a room or whatever. And what's the relationship between language and that particular physical setting or an object or the thing it's purportedly describing. And we think of language often as something objective um, or describing something clearly, but actually there's a lot of give between what language is supposedly doing and what, it, what its relationship to the, the things it is describing. There's, um, you know, they're between a word you know, like chair and the actual chair, you don't really have an equal sign between those two objects, you have a kind of unequal sign. And that was why, also in that first book, I tried never to write the same poem twice. I tried to write a different poem with every effort. So, so there was no attempt to sort of codify a particular style. Um, but then, you know, when I, when I, you know, I got, a, I got an email from Douglas Messerly at Sun and Moon saying, you know, we'd like to publish your book. Um, I don't know how he got my name or anything. I just, I don't know what it was, that was about. But then I had a huge problem because I had all these, um, I had like um, 70 or 80 poems and I didn't know how to organize the book. Like, it's just a big mess, right? It's a big conglomeration. So, um, and you know, so that idea of a poetry book is a kind of agglomeration of things um, without particular chapters was also something very interesting to me, but it proved problematic in terms of, well, 
okay, how am I gonna package this for a particular reader and how am I gonna organize it? And I found that problem to be recurring. Like, um, you know, my second book was a long disco oriented ambient thing. It was very, it was long poem. And so it was no longer short poems. It was very different from what I did, but I was very interested in that sort of long, slightly changing uh, durational element of reading and of, of, of text over time. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. <clears throat> absolutely absolutely and and actually i wondered at this point if we could um we'll come back to sculpture and those questions of the sculptural but but <clears throat> while we're with the question of writing and literature in the round can we stay there because you you're both very prolific writers of all kinds of different kinds of texts let's say um so can i ask you a little bit about that about writing as a broader practice for you and, and, and the relevance it has to to what you consider the kind of key drives of the, your practice. So Luis, can I turn to you first? Because although known as a visual artist, writing has always been something you've done quite prolifically. Yeah, but <clears throat> it's not that I have a particular attachment to writing. It's just that certain problems require when they are solved to be communicated in a specific packaging. Mm -hmm. So there are problems that I can express better in writing than in drawing or in, in whatever other media. And so basically I picked the best medium possible that corresponds to the problem I'm working on or to the problem I identify and uh, so when i have to deal with an opinion obviously it's more efficient to talk about it than to uh, make a picture or sometimes you need both and i guess illustration good illustration takes care of that that illustration is just redundant and doesn't do much but a good illustration complements and enriches uh, the text and vice versa so uh, I actually, I don't like being described as a writer because uh, I sometimes say it's like uh, describing a philosopher as a typist. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit unfair. You know? So I hate it when I say, uh, they ask me, and, uh, what do you do? And I'm an artist. Oh, you paint which is exactly the same. Oh, I'm a philosopher. Oh, you type. And nobody as an artist asks me, oh, and what problem are you trying to work on? Which is really what makes me an artist, not the other part. The other part is an accident. It's a biographical and a social accident and an imposition, which I resent and which I have been fighting all my life. Mm -hmm. So I don't have many hats. I'm an artist. I'm an artist and from that point of view, I look at the world and my quality control is from that point of view. Mm -hmm. If I write a piece on sociology, my standards are not sociological, my standards are artistic. Am I finding the right solution to the problem? Is my problem interesting? Am I conveying the solution in the best way possible? And those are artistic considerations, although yeah. people wouldn't recognize it as that. But ultimately, my main question is, what if? And that's an open yeah. question. That's not a disciplinary question. That is an all-encompassing question that requires imagination. So in that, and I was floored by Tan's work. I never had seen it before. And I'm immensely grateful that you put us together here. But there's something that is very shared by both of us and in which he is much better than I am, which is to explore the in-between stuff, not the language itself, but the in-between of what he uses as a generator and how he puts it. And you don't end up stuck with the language, but you are end up stuck with an incredible flow of insights, which is sometimes overwhelming, but I love his 
narrative work yeah. because of that. Each sentence is shaking me up. And yeah. one thing I resented, well, I did not resent, I was disappointed, is to find out that an image he puts in his book, which is wet paint, thank you, wasn't his, but it was found. <laughs> and for me, that piece sums us both. It's not the wet paint, it's not the thanks, not the thank you. It's all that world that happens in between those two lines yeah. in which you just navigate endlessly. And that's a quality he is a master of in his writing. Well, I'm, I'm so pleased you, you've, um, you've really introduced that third term, media, which in a sense is the in-betweenness of things in its biggest sense. Um, and and I, I, actually, we could come back to that in a sec, but <clears throat> there's a question that's come in here from the audience, <clears throat> which seems timely for me to introduce now. And I'll, I'll ask it as it's arrived, because I, I, I think it's directed to you, Luis, and what you were saying about knowledge work. Can making alone be enough, or does the artist have to understand what they're contributing to knowledge? Ultimately, yes, I think the artist has to understand what is being contributed to the knowledge. What's nice about art is that <clears throat> you don't have to start from a problem. You can start from a solution and that there are no mistakes. There are only solutions that are waiting for the problem. I mean, there are only mistakes for a predetermined problem that wants that solution to work, but that's unfair to the solution to, to demean it as an error. Mm -hmm. It's just a different solution. And you have maybe have to look for the problem that fits correctly. That together problem and solution have to, once they come together, they cannot be unstuck anymore. And if they can be unstuck, then there's something that has not been worked out. But that's a part of knowledge. Now, making sometimes puts you in the mood of finding problems and the material talks back. And there you have uh, a power distribution, which, which ultimately is what matters most to me is, where's the power, who controls it? Why don't I have it? And whose interests am I following in what I'm doing? So in the relation with the material, you can either accept the material as a part of the team, or you have a dictatorial power of making the material do whatever you want. And that is considered virtuosity or virtuosic thing, which is problematic because it's totally focused on the craft and not on the knowledge part. So. Yeah, thank okay, you. I admire Bernini, for instance, as a craftsman. But I really admire the transportation he produces in which a piece of marble becomes living flesh, apparently. Mm -hmm. So it's not the craftsmanship, it's the transportation part, okay? Mm -hmm. And in other classic, you know, Michelangelo, I have whatever problems I can project on his work are not of interest to me. <clears throat> so I admire him. I mean, he was a phenomenal sculptor, but I admire him as a phenomenal sculptor and not for what he contributes to my knowledge. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> makes total sense. Um, I'm gonna pull us back onto track and, and, and I wanna come back, Tan, to, to something that you left us with, uh, with your <laughs> last answer <clears throat> about where the poetry's at more recently. Uh, um, and I just wanted to ask you about the relationship between what you do in the name of poetry and your broader writing life. Because I know that there's, you know, fiction in the work. There have been lots of um, mongrel sort of anti-generic forms along the way, often involving digital media as well. So can we talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I don't I haven't really written much poetry. I think maybe in the last seven or eight years. I mean, I'm not sure what poetry is at the moment. The, um, which is a good thing, I think, actually. Um, <clears throat> and 
Yeah, I've been working on sort of a long fiction. Um, it's basically about my family, my mother and father, and you know how they came to the United States. So that's sort of the thing that's preoccupied me. Um, and I think in general, sort of to answer the question is sort of writing is, um, you know, it's just, you know, people sort of, when they read a book, they sort of typically poetry or, author or literature represses the sort of medial element, i.e. people forget when you read a book that you're actually reading a book. So, and I like to heighten those facts. I have all the sort of paratextual elements, um, the marketing elements, um, just how things get captioned, all those sorts of things are very much a part of the reading process. So that's the sort of medial component. And the other thing that's often suppressed in literature is, uh, well, it's, a, it's perceived to be a very interiorized experience. I write, you pick up a book and you read it on your own. But I was much more interested in the sort of social elements of reading, i.e., well, so what if, you, what if you force people to read a novel? You mean you go and you project words on a screen, right? And so it's a kind of filmic experience. But people, when they go to the cinema or when they go to a dark room and you have something projected, they don't really expect to see, they don't expect to read a novel on the screen. So I think those, writing in that sense for me is something that's, it's a medial practice. Again, to remind people that when you pick up a book, you're actually reading a book. That if you put pictures in a book, that alters how you read, it changes the book. Um, you know, um, you know, in reference even to what Luis was talking about earlier, that little poster, the wet paint, thank you. I also thought that was very funny when I saw it. I found it in a hotel, it was, uh, the Royalton Hotel, the Philippe Stark Hotel, and obviously they maybe painted something. And they were also thanking me at the same time for, I don't know what, for, I didn't do the painting, but maybe for not touching something that was wet paint. So there was all, all sorts of in-betweenness in that message as, as Luis was talking about, like it wasn't being communicated by just those two words. And the most interesting and amusing thing about the sign was, oh, well, I shouldn't sit here because I'm going to get my pants covered with paint and they're thanking me for, but I'm not quite sure for what. And it was sort of, and that was also what was so fascinating about, um, you know, looking at Luis's texts, like, and then I was sort of like, he did these self portraits where he used stenciling, right? Um, self portrait. Okay. But he uses something very standardized to get at something that I think of as highly individualized. And then, and I would ask Luis about this actually. Um, so he did the Uruguayan torture series where he hand writes, um, you know, his, it's a little unclear wh what subject position we're in. It could be the person who's experienced the torture. It could be an empathetic act by someone who is outside of that system and is trying to understand it, but those lines are very blurred. So that in-betweenness is, is very interesting because you have on the one hand, like languages can feel very individualized, but language is also quite standardized and generic too. And, you know, you get that self-portrait where it says, you know, you know, and you know it's a self-portrait of Lewis, but it's done with language. And then you have a very personal and individualized relationship to sort of Uruguayan torture. And yeah, that's, I just thought that, oh, that's so interesting because each of those language acts does something very specific. It's instantiated in a very particular way. You have handwriting on the one hand and you have a kind of mechanical stenciling on the other. And each of those attempts to describe something, Uruguayan torture or Luis as a person, are very, very different because of the language, not just the language being used, but the way in which that language was transmitted. So a stencil and a piece of handwriting are very different things. And each of those things purports to describe something that we have in the work. And yet many things are left in between or left out of that. So when you, know, when you have the highly individual reading of Uruguayan torture, you're also aware that there's a historical condition here that's, you know, that's it's massive. It took place with you know, US government aid. It was a historical thing that took place over a long period of time. And yet the individual handwriting thing works a little bit against that because it's very localized. It's just one moment. It's a photograph of a finger with string on it. It's very personal, right? But then you have this large political historical event that's, you know, that's opposed to that. And likewise with the self-portrait, you have, you know, 
a portrait which is supposed to be individualized and yet you have a very generic sort of labeling system, self-portrait or Lewis Gamnitz or uh, attached to that. So I thought I found that just utterly fascinating, but it gets to that sort of in-betweenness in terms of what language can do. It's material instantiation, whether it's a stencil or a piece of handwriting and how that relates to the object it purports to describe. And I think that's that in-betweenness really comes in there. I mean, I was also very, very happy um, that I got to, um, you know, to look at a lot of Luis's work. I mean, I went through that at Alexander Grace site. You know, I, I looked at a, a lot of stuff. It was a real pleasure, I have to say, a huge pleasure. You know, I'm looking forward to having coffee with Luis now. We don't live that far <laughs> apart. So, I, you know, I have a lot of questions for Luis and I really want to, you know, I want to really, you know, ask him some some questions. Can I, can that was I, a that was a preliminary question in some ways. So. <laughs> can I can I ask you about your attraction there, Tan, to these very granular questions of mediation that relate to form and formal, like pencil, stencil, etc. Is your attraction to those? Does it come from a place? Are they coming because you're interested in those same questions in your work as well? Because well, there was a very minute attention to things we might associate um, blindly with graphic design, um, but actually affect the reading experience in your own work and your own books, like a misuse of paratextual identity markers, etc. Yeah, I want to return to Luisa's work. This is, this, I'm still thinking about it. And I haven't figured things out. So, but you know, the use of the stenciling there really, for me, suggests like bureaucracy, bureaucratization, um, standardization, a pursuit of the typical, and interested in iconotypes, um, and that sort of very general sort of range of what I would also that also falls into the category of the generic. And I'm very interested in generic kinds of language, languages yeah. sort of boring and that sort of thing. I'm, you know, Seven Controlled Vocabularies was all about writing, um, you know, writing an individual autobiography in terms of sort of, you know, um, just very generic categories. So yeah, so the, the fact that Luis was using these sorts of very standardized, like stenciling is the sort of, I associate with, you know, um, you know, very sort of generic um, bureaucracies and stuff. And, and that can set something that where we all live in. We live in a very administered life world. So given that, where does individuate, you know, individual things? And then you get that with that handwriting. That's a very individual reaction to something that's massive and disturbing on a historical scale, you know, that happened in Uruguay. So uh, yeah, that's, yeah, so I'm I'm very interested in yeah that element of form because I think it points to you know and again Luis talked about that also you know we, the artwork is kind of an individual performance but it takes place in a social space and you know the codification of language i.e. its formal elements um, you know hints to you know the kind of world we live in you know we live in a very sort of administered life world now where so many things are sort of controlled by you know you know, larger forces. And that shows up in how, like, what language looks like um, and how we read it. So. Yeah. Luis, can, can, we, can we go over to you there then? And maybe with the stencils in mind, because one of the things I associate with a stencil is it's a kind of um, uh, impromptu sign making technique. And I guess this idea of signs is a recurrent feature in your use of language within your artwork. There's often plaques. There are often public notices. Um, so could we jump to there and the kinds of sign making, you, you, or the ways in which you use language in sign making in the work? Uh, in that period, which was, uh, I guess, 66 to 70 or so, the, those are box lettering. The stencils are to mark boxes. Right. And they're basically anonymous, yeah. which is a step further of what we're talking about. And so in the set of self-portraits, which actually is uh, serious, it's exactly the same image. The only variation is that one is 1968, one is 1969, one is 1970, 71, and 72. So there are four which means that nothing changed over those years. And I should have been obsessive enough to keep it up until today, but was too lazy. 
so I figured making four is enough. Uh, there was a permanence. I, I wanted to deal with the permanence of the self-portrait and therefore the irrelevance of self-portraiture and the social label. And suddenly the self-portrait is not a personal thing, it's an attributed thing. Mm -hmm. And therefore the anonymous stenciling, which also I used for a lot of other work, was appropriate. And what's interesting is at the time there was a, a Japanese American artist, Arakawa, who is not anymore that present, but was present then, and uh, who used the same stencils. And he was already in good galleries and known, and I was an Uruguayan that landed in the US, totally unknown. So I was told immediately, uh, don't use that because you will be confused with Arakawa, which I felt so. <laughs> I mean, if we're talking about anonymity, what's the point of fixing it on an individual and make an authorship thing? Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So it was not about leaving my mark, it was about leaving this problem, yeah. which he probably would have agreed with, but uh, we never discussed it. In any case, it was the Uruguayan torture Yes, the Tan's description is correct, but it was a very personal problem. That is, I made it my problem. And in that yeah. sense, the Uruguayan torture, although being caused externally for political reasons that interested another country and not my country, and so on and so on, the effect by affecting my friends, a lot of my friends were tortured. And if I had been in Uruguay at the time, I would have been part of that because I was in the circle of the victims. And it was a very erratic thing. I mean, a lot of people that were much more politically committed than I was were running free. And a lot of people that were less committed than I was were being tortured. So it was this uh, uh, fear by random that the dictatorship was using. So all that made me internalize it and bring it out again. And that's why handwriting. Yeah. And again, there are things that need to be presented handwritten and things that need to be anonymous or things that need to be aesthetified or so on. But it's not a matter of style choice. It's a matter of finding the appropriate presentation mm. for what you're saying. Okay, so I, I, you, I, I, I always told my students I, I could, if I could, I could give this class singing like an opera singer, but you would be totally disconcerted because it would not be the right vehicle mm. for what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. Or I could talk to you like two year olds, and then you would be disconcerted. And, I couldn't talk like I'm talking to you to two-year-olds because they wouldn't have a clue of what I'm doing. So you're measuring the choice of words when you are talking and the cadence and the use of curse words to wake them up sometimes, yeah. which I did in class <laughs> because it was unexpected. And so on. that's all part of the manipulation of the public. And as artists, we are manipulators and we better assume the responsibility for doing that. Because if we manipulate without responsibility, we are harming people. Mm. Mm. Uh, one of the things you brought up there, Luis, is this, this kind of awkward expectation of a link between personalization and authorship. And, and I think that's something that runs through both of your practices. And, yeah. and, and Tan, I wonder, you know, where, where Lewis is talking about these these methods of transmitting language that mm. that perform a kind of depersonalization, and as he mentioned there, with some of them they got to anonymization. <clears throat> the, the thing about depersonalization that's always struck me in your work, Tan, is that rather than going to anonymization, it goes to a kind of heteronomy. Like it seems to open up loads of different authors in the same space. The, or the space of the same work and one's never sure which ones to trust or who is really who 
And, and that seems to be part of the point of the work. Um, I was really interested to see those same tendencies sort of play out in a slightly more distilled way in some of this biographical writing you've been doing more recently, where one's not quite sure is that photo really the photo of a family member or a, you know? So I just wonder if we could talk about these, this, this kind of fault line between personalization and authorship and the way it opens up in your work a little tad. Well, you know, I think, yeah, also in a lot of the recent fiction, yeah, the insomnia and the ant too, the just the relationship between the sort of author and the sort of main character. So there's a lot of auto fiction at work. And I think in the, um, either the Heath Ledger book, the um, Heath Korsbach, you know, I was following the accounting of Heath Ledger's, um, you know, death, um, you know, in various blog posts. And for me, the, oh, okay, so you had this sort of social mechanism that was registering a death in a kind of semi or quasi public mode. Um, and then you have this sort of poet reacting to this or the author me reacting to this. So there was a lot of overlap between sort of what I was feeling and what was being registered in a kind of online communications platform. And the line between those two things is sort of in the end eroded. So there, you know, you get this idea that, oh, well, who's authoring, who's authoring this event known as the chronicling of Heath Ledger's death um, at this particular moment? It was obviously experienced in a sort of community or social setting. And I was very interested in blurring the lines between sort of individual textual production and a sort of shared community moment wherein we're all sort of reading together. And the construction of Heath Ledger's death um, is something that's enacted in the reading processes. Um, but then of course I'm writing about it too at the same time and that intersects with various sort of blog things. So I think you're correct to say that the notion of who an author is is sort of being dissolved into other people, into other particular medial formats and into just a sort of, you know, when something, a community, it, it could have been any number of events that sort of, the news media gravitated towards that I could have focused on. It just happened to be um, Heath Ledger's death at that time because guess what? That's what I was. That's when I decided to write this book. Mm -hmm. So there was a time frame um, attached to the writing of a book, and that time frame latched onto a particular historical event. Um, it could have been another historical event. It would have been probably just as effective. Um, and then all the material about sort of keeping a public diary, the Samuel Pepys material which had been sort of uh, was available publicly as a download on Project Gutenberg. That's again an example of a kind of erosion between sort of the book or the codex form and again a distribution in an online format. So that changes how reading is taking place. It changes the community around a particular book. And so you can't really think of a book as just an object. A book is an object in a, in a communal space that's being read collaboratively and all that sort of stuff creates this thing called meaning. Um, and that thing called meaning is actually very complicated when you can, when it's sort of, when it's bifurcated between individual production and communal reception and communal reading practices. So this is all being sort of melded together um, in that sense. I don't, again, I don't know if that really sort of gets at what you were talking about, but. Um, Absolutely, Tan, thank you. That was a great answer. Um, Luis, can, hmm. can I come back to the, this, this question about this awkward expectation about authorship in relationship to artisthood? Now, I don't want to ask you to rehearse something you've talked about loads of times, but, but it connects, I think, to some of that framing you did in your earlier answers this evening about where you feel you're at now as, as someone who's involved in the production of knowledge. And so what's the awkward relationship there to authorship and authorial identity for you now? Well, I think uh, they annihilate each other. <laughs> and that's a problem. I, I, today, I would say that my success as an artist will be determined when I become anonymous right. and not when I enter history as a name. <laughs> that if I enter history as a name, then everything will be encapsulated in my name and my biography. And what I really want is to affect the collective consensus and enrich it and empower the members of that collective uh, society mm -hmm. to improve. And that will be happening much better if they take certain values for granted and not keep referring to me as the one that threw the ball into motion. Mm -hmm. 
okay? I mean, is this assuming that I am having some effect, which I'm not, but the presumption of authorship is based on, yes, that you will change the world by your efforts, which is mythical. I, I doubt that Picasso will be of any relevance 500 or 1,000 years from now, because the problems he dealt with are typical for the beginning of the 20th century and not even relevant today. And the consumer base of humanism is pretty much, I think, in terms of percentage of the population, it's pretty stable. It's not that the cubist vision has taken over Renaissance vision. We're still looking at things from a, a stage theater point of view and not broken up, even if in fact, biological, we may, but we're not taking it in consciously. I mean, we tend to scan things rather than to perspectivize and to rebuild images from the scanning. But we're not aware of that. And it's not a cultural part, it's more a biological part. So there is uh, this out of phase between fame of people and actual cultural effect. Yeah. And if we're interested in cultural effect, then we better become more humble yeah. and do not deal with our name and our fame which is ultimately a commercial issue. I was shocked, I read <clears throat> a year or so ago, there was an interview with Richard Dawkins. Mm. And uh, they asked him, what are you reading lately? And he said, oh, I'm reading a lot of autobiographies because I'm working on mine. And what a waste of time. <laughs> on both ends, on reading that stuff, which is totally irrelevant, and I wanted to add to that irrelevancy your own. And that, in certain ways, was embedded in the self-portrait series. I wasn't aware of that. Mm. But if I have to be my own critic, I would say, oh, that's really the interesting point of that piece. It's, it's really interesting to me because, you know, Luis, you get to this position where there's a, a, a kind of socially responsive sense of identifying a problem and then working the problem and, and the, the artwork being contextually codependent on the problem. And, and, and Tan, in your earlier answer, you know, you're really talking about the process of the Heath Ledger book, you're really sort of talking in part about tuning into these kind of media channels and in some sense using the book as a way of joining the chorus. Um, so in both cases, there's a sense of something like a documentary impulse, I see. Um, and I know that that's a loaded term, and I don't mean documentary in any kind of journalistic genre sense, which pretends to show the truth of the past, but more like an impulse to, to sort of deal with history in its real time uh, and, and show the truth of an attempt to access the past. So, and, and Luis, you, you, you know, you have this recurring uh, engagement with often issues of social injustice mm -hmm. in the past. Tan, you know, we see social histories coming up very quickly, often through these immediate media feeds like social media and things like this, where the personal becomes a complicated category. So I just wonder, I know this is a very big prompt, it's not even really a question, but can we talk about these impulses, something like this documentary impulse? And I'm wondering if it feels like it fits when you think about your own practices. Luis, can I ask you that first? Yeah, no, I was thinking about uh, Tan, I mean, about uh, insomnia, the insomnia piece, which fascinates me also because he is constructing a biography, which doesn't matter if it's real or not, but which is created by the objects that surround mm. the possible uh, character. And that's much closer to reality than what we are led to believe in this uh, hubris of individual impact. And I find that that's somehow also connected uh, 
with Borges, with the writing of Borges, in which so everything contains everything, and you just have to unravel it. So it's it's unraveling what matters and not anything else. And unraveling is really ultimately a collective task, an anonymous task that enriches uh, knowledge. But it's not anecdotal. I mean, yeah. those things are triggers for broader issues. Okay, yeah. Okay, so they try to realign the conditions of knowledge. And when the anecdote is really uh, damaging, then how do we get rid of it? Not how do we keep, uh, how do we get rid of it structurally? Not, uh, yeah, I mean, I have problems, for instance, with the destruction of uh, obnoxious offensive monuments. I think they should be kept and not erased from history because that's really washing history as if things didn't happen. And if we keep them, but open them to vandalism or to graffiti or to comments or make it a free, if monuments in general, even the positive ones would be zones of comment, they would be much more useful for good and for redressing issues than by selecting, okay? But all monuments ultimately are representing interests and we don't have a possibility of exposing those interests. The monument would be interesting if you could use it to expose the interest and then empower people to select the interests that are constructive and the ones that are distracted and have that as a continual educational process. And art, should be like that as well. So many monuments if you want. And I think uh, uh, vandalism of art is infraction of property, but not infraction necessary of knowledge. It's symptom. I mean, I'm thinking of this, this moment. So yeah. I have to be careful about yeah. the consequences of what I'm saying. But uh, ownership, copyright, I there's somebody online that uses a piece of mine, one version of a piece. The piece is, uh, this is a mirror your written sentence. Mm. And I had it produced by a sign maker in vacuum format. And somebody online ap appropriated that visually and made up his own sentences in the same vein with the same focus and the same visual effect. So in fact, if you don't know that I didn't do those pieces, mm -hmm. people honestly would think I did it. And I think that's terrific. That's terrific. It's a shifting my piece to the collective. So that guy is anonymous. It's not that uh, John Smith is assuming ownership of the authorship. No, he is redistributing in an anonymous collective way the piece that that person I don't know if it's man or woman, actually. I don't know who it is. Feels it's interesting to pursue. And it's that what we want to happen, the pursuing. Yeah. Is, is, is that a spirit you recognize, Tan? That spirit of wanting the pursuit, that kind of social, readily pursuit of the questions raised by the work? Well, I was really struck by what Louis said when he was sort of talking about, an, uh, about wanting to be anonymous. Um, and that's, you know, it's something I've tried to do in my writing all the way through. So I feel sort of a, a sort of kinship with Luis, um, as he probably knows. I've been sending him a lot of emails too uh, <laughs> over the last couple of days. But, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to spam him. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, the desire for anonymity has been sort of, you know, just very strong in that practice. And, you know, I was thinking back, you know, in terms of your earlier question about sort of documentary yeah. practices and so on. <clears throat> like, well, in Insomnia, I was really just trying to create this thing, which was what it was it like to be Chinese American in America in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And I had the only way I could recreate that really was to use objects to do it. So those objects like a TV set, um, and my aunt really is, she's a fictional, she's an object too. 
which is an emanation of a TV set. So, you know, in, the, in those cases, like the TV and the, the sort of um, the vending machine at the end are all elements of what I would call forensic evidence, um, documentary evidence that, I, that I'm using to sort of create a kind of experience out of. And that's really how I thought about sort of a lot of Luis's work is very powerful because there's also that forensic element to it. You know, the Luis cabinets are in stencils across that period of four years. That's forensic evidence of who Luis was. But as Luis says, it doesn't really communicate that in those four years, Luis might have been a very different person. And the only hint at the, at the changes in his personhood over those four years is what? It's a stencil date at the, on the right-hand side. You know, you have self-portrait and then you have a date. So you have 1969, 70, 71, and 72. And you see also how inadequate those sorts of containers are. But then you also realize how in the sort of big scheme of things, individual production is, is really to look at this sort of, you know, kind of realistic way. Individual production is so minor in relationship to sort of the world we live in. And that world we live in is, you know, that that sort of life world. Um, you know, the primary inf the primary ingredient is information and its communication over time. And yes, what do those four portraits do over four years? They communicate a bit of information over a four year period. They're serial works, like most of Luis's works. They're all, they're they're serial and they're very rooted in sort of forensic evidence over a durational period of time, which makes them sort of fascinating. Um, so, you know, I would just say that that sort of quest for anonymity, I think, is sort of key to the kind of world we live in now, right, where individual production is just one part of a much larger sort of medial set of um, transmission practices and the sorts of language that I could sort of participate in or, or create in relationship to this sort of overall structure are, oh, they're kind of very minor um, in that sense. So therefore anonymity seems just a realistic way to position oneself as a practicing, uh, practicing artist or individual. And you know, that whole thing about my mother and my father in insomnia, they're like, um, you know, what was, who were they at that particular time in America? They were hardly noticeable in a way. Um, you know, they didn't really have a kind of voice or a way to sort of talk about things. They were kind of, you know, and so the association with them and TV sets and, well, that was what that experience was like for me growing up too. So, well, how do you communicate that? It's, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, that, it's complicated, but what Louis said was just about being that anonymous position, something I could really relate to. I, I haven't connected these questions of identity with, this phrase you've used before, Tan, of ambient literature before, but mm. that anonymity becoming part of a background or a mass or an ambience, is, is that part of it? Yes, what absolutely. Yeah. yeah, completely. Um, I have also, I've got two questions. One's going to take us, the, the important one's going to take us to the question of sculpture, but one's really facile, Tan. You can't tell us that your aunt is a TV set and then not tell us more. So <laughs> please, can you tell us, how would your aunt a TV set? Well, I just, you know, I had to sort of like, I was trying to figure out, well, what would it be like to describe um, being Chinese American with my parents in the eighties? And we just watched a lot of TV. So I think the sort of primal family experience for us and seeing what America was like, was like, is, uh, that we did together was watching the TV. So- That's part of a kind of acculturation, a, a kind of, trying to become familiar? I think so. I don't know. My parents, you know, they spoke with accents. Um, I didn't hear it, of course. You know, I was shocked, I think, in like when I was in second or third grade, one of my friends came over and said, oh, your dad, I can't, I have trouble understanding him. He speaks with such an accent. And I'm like, really? I don't hear it at all. I think he speaks perfect English. I mean, he spoke perfectly for me. I thought he spoke, his English was just fine. I didn't hear it. You know, that was all I had. That's what we lived with. So, well, how do you then, you know, how do you communicate what it was like to be, we were quite foreign, you know, in Ohio. I, you, know, you know, my parents told me stories about, you know, you know, when they tried to go rent an apartment and so on, um, you know, in Seattle when they were in grad school, my mother could speak English without much of an accent, you know, so she would call and ask, well, we were, you know, right after my parents got married, she said, oh, 
they wanted to move into a bigger apartment. So my mother would look at the classifieds and they would call a place and the, you know, the person on the phone would answer and they say, oh yeah, yeah, I'll come right over. It's just come and take a look. And they would, my parents would go to the, to the apartment and look at it and no one would answer the door. Yeah. You know, a few minutes later. So, you know, it was like, so how could I communicate that experience of being, you know, you know, a foreigner in America at that time. Um, and for me, it was a TV set that was, so she was kind of, that sort of encapsulate, encapsulated the experience, that identity, whatever it was. Um, but for me, it was really kind of an object, so. It's really interesting. So, so, so these objects have, have, a, have, a, have a kind of awkward representational place in the work. And, and, and Luis, a moment ago, when you were talking about memorials and, and your feeling about the current difficulty with memorials, you were expressing what I would call a kind of anti-memorial position, oh, sorry, an anti-monumental position, that the problem should stay as a scar so that we can continue to deal with the problem. Um, again, a kind of awkward objecthood, if you like. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if this is a, I, I don't think we're talking about anti-sculpture, but I wonder if we could come round now in this sort of final section of the, the conversation to these questions or these, these qualities that we associate with the sculptural and the role they do or don't have in your practices. Um, again, it's a very open prompt, but, and, and, and you've both been very clear about a kind of disrecognition from the category sculpture or poetry or any of these other kind of genre identities, but... In terms of sculptural qualities, Luis, could we start with you maybe? What role yeah, do they continue I mean, to play? I, I know you have to ask that question because this is a Henry Moore affair. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think the question distracts the issue. Okay. All those questions ultimately attached to a craft mm. are derailing our discussion. It's like saying, well, what's the role of uh, fuchsia color in your work. Mm. In my case, none. I never used it. That <laughs> takes care of the discussion. <laughs> so it is that the category of sculpture is broader than fuchsia, and therefore more things fit in, and we mm. could have a fake conversation about yeah, that, okay. but I don't think it leads anywhere. Okay. So yeah. it's really an issue of what problems are you dealing with and yeah. how are you trying to solve them? And what elements of cognition are you using in order to do that? And I am in this moment actually contending with the issue of art and design that they always are together in schools, it's a school of art and design. And nobody really figures out that they are totally contradictory that in design you set up a problem and you know that the solution is embedded in the problem you start digging and excavating until you find the raisin in the pie and in art the raisin there are many there are infinite raisins floating all over the space and they're outside of the problem and what you're trying to do is grab the best raisin that fits your problem the best way so that they cannot separate again. So in terms of research methodology, they are at opposite ends. One is centripetal, the other one is centrifugal. So they should be in separate schools. And then you have separations that creative writing is in one school and visual arts is in another one and music is still in another one. So Presumably, they are looking for the same unknown mm. and just using different media. So why do you have to divide a media? We should be all working together and let people pick, okay, I will use a little bit of music, a little bit of writing, a little bit of sculpture, mm. put them together and do it. So it's really not about keeping orders, but seeing how can you mix system of orders mm. and subvert the system so that you're liberated and are flexible to continually create new systems of order. Yeah. And art is crucial for that, not because it's using bronze cast or oil painting 
or photography, but because it's able to, to travel between orders and undo them, destroy them, exploit them. In that sense, art is by nature a subversive in political activity in the best way possible because it's constructive subversion and it's constructive destruction and it's constructive re-articulation of things. Yeah. And that is what should be taught. Tan, can I ask you, does that sense of, of creativity or artistry being a pursuit of the unknown or a pursuit of the impossible maybe, is that something that chimes with you? Yes, but you know the I think the the pursuit of sort of the <clears throat> things that are um, unexpected or surprising. Um, yes, that's always a you know that's always what one is engaged in in some sense. Um, <clears throat> but in my work, I always try to downplay that because the surprise element or the unexpected, um, just I think by the nature of sort of how we live today and whatever mm -hmm. is. Is, is minimized, um, you know, it's, it's sort of tamped down. And so you get a little bit of, um, you get a little bit of self-expression here and you get a little bit of self-expression there. Um, you know, there's nothing, I didn't want anything like sublime and I didn't want anything like, you know, I don't even like, you know, the, like the major emotions and stuff. I'm sort of something more, something a little, much more sort of like, um, a mood it was something that, that I was more interested in, you know. And I, I've talked about, you know, you go to the movies, um, independent cinema and Hollywood movies are all about sort of wrenching a big fat emotion out of you. And they're very good at doing that, you know, it's deliberate. Um, but I was really interested in the sort of much, much sort of lower level affected being, you know. And I, you know, I was thinking about sort of Heidegger's, you know, idea of Stimmung and just this overall mood or uh, receptiveness um, that precedes actually the, uh, the eruption of an emotion or a major feeling. Because, well, I feel like, oh, that's how I spend most of my life. I'm not, you know, anger, angry or frustrated 90% of the time. I'm just sort of in this sort of state. And I was sort of interested in the literature that was sort of could access that modality of being. Um, and in relationship to the human, the human is also downplayed. I, you know, I was reading a lot of Bruno Latour um, and just the relationship between objects and people in a sort of, a, you know, is a sort of sort of symbiotic environment. That's was interesting to me too. And that's also sort of downplays the sort of notion of an individual producing some sort of monumental, monumental, um, you know, experience in some sort of way. So I would just, I would just say those, those things. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I realize that you've each referred to one another's work often, and I keep cutting in and stopping conversation from brewing between the two of you. But we have just a couple of minutes, and I don't know if there's any of those threads you want to come back to and pick up, because I, 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 it feels a shame to leave them cut. Well, Luis, when would you like to get together and have a cup of coffee? <laughs> oh, whenever, I mean, whenever you go to say Osset and pass great neck, just let me know. <laughs> Well, look, I, 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 you both a, a big thank you um, for your patience and for pulling me back on to the right track as well. Um, I thank everyone in the audience for sending in their questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. And oh, as per our usual protocol, I didn't name you when questions came up um, unless you asked to be named. So thank you for feeding them in. I hope I did a job on your behalf. But you can also always go to the microsite and the event page and find those reference resources at the bottom. So there's a set of reference resources connecting to each event in the series, and there are a few things we think are relevant for you to follow up on. Um, a big thank you to Claire and her colleagues at the Henry Moore Institute for facilitating not only tonight, but this whole series. I've really enjoyed them. I hope you have too. And the recordings will be available some probably in April, um, I think, when we update the, uh, the microsite. Um, a massive thank you to Tan and Luis for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been a chance for me to ask you both things I've wanted to ask anyway. So on a selfish note, it's been great. And I'm sure given the audience reaction, um, others have enjoyed it too. Um, I don't think there's anything else for me to convey. So I'm going to thank everyone in the audience for joining us this evening. And 
I'm sorry for the abrupt finish, but thanks everyone. Thank you for putting Thank us you. together. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> Thank you, Claire, too. Bye. Thank you, Kirsty.